Hello, uh, my name is Mike Watza, and welcome to the impact of COVID-19 on municipal security. Uh, you may have seen my name re related to telecommunications issues and ProTech and so on. Um, one of the things we do is, at Kitch is cybersecurity as well. So I'm going to work from left to right, I think. So John DiMaggio is um, the founder of Blue Orange, which is the cybersecurity group that our healthcare clients go to uh, for these issues and that we work with and have worked with for many years. Uh, to my right is Bill Shawman, who I've known for decades. Bill has been a cybersecurity and privacy expert to the financial industry for most of his career. And um, he has done some consulting with municipals and other interests as well. And then there's Devin McKinder down there on the left. And Devin is the IT director at the city of Portage and also a longtime client and appreciate him being involved. In fact, I think if we look back at this long enough, it, it might've been Devin who came up with this idea. So, um, and then there's Karina Kratz, my partner. Uh, she is a licensed IP uh, tele, uh, patent attorney and uh, the real technology guru in our firm. So she and I work together on telecom and cybersecurity issues as well. Um, so the hope here today is frankly to do just a micro presentation uh, in lieu of the presentation we planned on doing in April at the annual meeting. This will be much shortened, uh, but interestingly, of course, the reason we're not meeting in person is COVID-19. And so we're going to try and hit some of the high points about what's happened in the cybersecurity world given the advent of COVID-19. I will present a few points uh, the idea here, by the way, is for you to come away with not only some uh, interesting background and why you might want to be paying attention to these issues, but also some good resources that are included in the PowerPoint that you'll be able to access when you access this program. And then also, obviously, uh, you'll hopefully put some names and faces together with folks who you might already be working with or, or can work with in the future on these kinds of issues. So. Uh, one of the entities that I go to on a regular basis to see what's going on with the internet um, is uh, a group that I call Akamai. I'm probably saying it wrong, but uh, they are, I think, fairly well acknowledged as one of the global internet managers or, or however you care to term it, uh, uh, characterize it. Um, but they, they really have their finger on the pulse of what's going on globally with the internet. So in a recent uh, blog they posted on April 29th, uh, they indicated that uh, internet traffic was up about 33% globally in March. And then uh, it, it, it resumed back to about 15% in, uh, above normal in April, which is interesting. Um, but it, 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 it touches on the fact that we're all seeing some glitches and delays in some of our internet usage uh, because frankly, the overburdened system is now even more overburdened. Uh, these patterns vary by state and even by city based on, in many respects, the emergency declarations that are going on and that you're all very familiar with. Uh, interestingly, uh, weekend use has leveled out with weekday use. It used to be weekdays were heavier volume, weekends were less. Now it's about the same across the board because if you're like me, and that probably everyone on this on this presentation, you're working every day. Um, so, uh, what's the effect of cybersecurity on uh, or COVID on cybersecurity? Well, uh, the first is, uh, and again, this is tracking uh, some articles from Akamai and others. Um, employees are stressed, and they're stressed about COVID nineteen. And so they're probably out there doing a little more looking for information than they would normally. And of course, they're not supposed to do that on company or business or city time, but, but they do. Uh, we all know that. And so they may be inclined to click on phishing emails or click on stories that lead them to malicious web pages and so on. The second big issue, and the one I think I've heard the most about and certainly read about the most, and we've seen some of, is the fact that we're now all working remotely. And those home computers 
are typically not as well protected or part of our uh, set of protocols uh, as they are as we have set up in the office. So that uh, and that and mobile, frankly, uh, also increased usage equals a uh, what some have called a target rich environment. So securing endpoint devices becomes a significant bigger challenge and and my my engineering friends will talk about all this in much more detail. Um, I'm basically telling you why you need to pay attention um, or should. Uh, hackers are using off the shelf malware kits. Thousands of new sites are being registered daily for phishing attacks, distributing malware, ransomware, or financial fraud, tricking users into paying for fake cures, supplements, or vaccines. Uh, phishing attacks take advantage of healthcare crisis by uh, focusing on terms like corona, coronavirus, the World Health Organization, et cetera. And all of this is in our PowerPoint, and you can refer to the websites where these articles exist. Some other critical reference points that you, you're going to want to have at your fingertips and probably ought to sign up for updates on a regular basis, or at least make sure your IT director is, is doing that, which I'm sure they probably are. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, C-I-S-A, as a website. Uh, there's also the Pentagon website. Uh, the FCC publishes a pandemic scam list website. And it's just a, a note that anybody can get hit. Um, the U.S. Health Agency uh, was attacked with a cyber attack shortly after the onset of uh, this uh, whole COVID issue. And last, the FBI, who uh, we hope, well, we had planned on them joining us in April live, uh, and we hope that they'll join us in April next year at the annual meeting live. But because of their internal policies, they were unable to join us on this recorded uh, program. But they want you to know that they have a great deal of information. They shared some of it with us, but we can't share it with you. Uh, but, but we're available, and they're available at the phone numbers that are listed in the PowerPoint. Uh, the one comment that they, they did offer in particular at the time, at the beginning of COVID, uh, we're all using Zoom. This is a Zoom web, webinar, and uh, they referred to Zoom bombings, and uh, they had a few thoughts to pass along about that, using uh, passwords, not sharing the password with, on social media, and so on. Um, all right, so that's my attempt at a uh, concise summary of, of what has happened as a result of COVID-19. Each of our speakers will speak to that uh, more specifically. Our next speaker is uh, Devin McKinder. Devin, take it away. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I've been the IT director here for the, at the City of Portage since 2002. Um, when I first started back in 02, network security, uh, it was on the radar screen, but it, it wasn't something that kept, kept me up at night, frankly. Unfortunately, uh, network security is now a full-time priority that takes up a large portion of my staff time and a significant ongoing um, financial expense to the city as well. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those initiatives that also is, is never completed. Uh, you have to endeavor to maintain your systems at all times update your strategies and your protocols on an ongoing basis because uh, the bad guys are always working against uh, your best laid plans. So um, what I'd like to do with the short time um, I have is pack in as much basic information as I can about basic net network security preparedness that will hopefully be um, of value to you. So in this first slide uh, titled best practice, um, We've decided at, at the City of Portage that we're going to adopt the Federal Bureau of Investigation's uh, multi-agency network security best practices with a special focus on ransomware for obvious reasons. Um, we also stay current with new industry standards as they come out. And we also utilize uh, top rated products and appliances, um, some of which I've list are shown on the screen, the icons of some of those uh, products there for you. Moving on to the next slide, um, what I'm calling protocol one, awareness, staff awareness training. This is really the most, the most important and most inexpensive 
protective step that your agency can take. Um, and you can implement it immediately. Um, obviously, you're going to involve your IT staff, whether they're in-house or outsourced. And you should also include your HR person, especially um, if you're going to be exacting penalties for failure to, to comply with some of these uh, awareness training protocols. And the reason that staff awareness training is the number one most important um, step that you can take is because over 90% of attacks to your network will come through your email and, and because they know that there's a person at the end of that email who's going to do something they shouldn't. So um, I would suggest that you can you consider developing a very stringent training plan that would include videos, presentations to staff. We use an application called Know Before, which is very helpful to us. It's, it's packed full of helpful videos that you can send out on a periodic basis. Uh, you can develop tests uh, that you can send out to staff, grade them on those tests. If they fail the test, you can make them take a mandatory video, which is what we do. And they basically lose access to certain parts of, of the network until they are able to pass that test. Um, so we take a pretty um, hardcore approach when it comes to staff awareness training for the city. But you can, you can um, take that on every, any kind of level you would like. Um, so just remember that, that there's all sorts of simu The other thing that you can do with this is develop simulated phishing emails to users. So try to get them to click on something um, that it's not actually a phishing email, a real one, but you're simulating it. And then again, you, you send them a, a helpful reminder of what they did wrong. Again, take the test and then move on. Um, going to the next slide, protocol two, uh, proactive protection. So this, this is simply a general overview. We could spend an entire presentation discussing each of these areas. The point of this slide is that your IT infrastructure protection plan needs to address these areas. So with regard to network security, for instance, I would say that the most important and again, least expensive thing that you could do right away is implement two-factor authentication. Uh, that's now a recommendation um, from, from many security sources. This can be a combination that works best for your staff. Uh, we're currently considering, obviously, username and password combined with a time-sensitive passcode uh, provided by a dongle of some kind that you could put on your desk or have on your keychain. Um, definitely have strong password rules based on the new National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. Um, NIST now recommends long passphrases versus passwords, like um, my dog Marley likes to eat cigarettes, which is actually true. I did have a dog named Marley and he had a nicotine addiction. Um, so the longer that passphrase, obviously something you can remember, um, the better. Uh, NIST still recommends including upper and lowercase uh, letters and numbers and special characters mixed into that passphrase as well. Uh, they also recommend using those phrases you can easily remember. And um, this now says that the length and complexity of a password is more important than changing passwords on a regular basis. Not that you shouldn't do that, but they're emphasizing the length and the passphrase itself. Um, so also, don't keep your passwords, kind of a no-brainer, don't keep your passwords on the network or on your desktop of your computer. Um, maybe keep it on an external drive or on a printed document that you never leave in the open. Um, there are also cloud-based password managers that are available now, but I personally, currently, I'm kind of reluctant to use those. Uh, I still have mine on a, on a piece of paper that's locked away. Um, other parts of network security that we'll, we won't go deeply into, but you have your routers and switches. Uh, you've got your uh, intrusion detection systems, your intrusion prevention systems, 
uh, load balancers that help increase availability by spreading data across many services. And they also help alleviate uh, what's called DDoS attacks or di uh, distributed denial of service. You have your proxies and your uh, VPNs. Uh, your unified threat manager is essentially an idea of combining all of the above into one single appliance. Um, and then endpoint security, essentially what we're talking about here is addressing risk presented by devices connecting to an enterprise network. These can be servers uh, or mobile devices. So if you're allowing mobile devices to connect your network, especially email, uh, endpoint protection is critical. And endpoint security blocks access attempts and other risky activity at the points of entry. I've highlighted email security. Again, getting back to that, it's most important and least expensive area that you can address. Again, 90 plus percent of cyber attacks use your email as the front door to your network. So make sure that you're filtering your inbound and outboard e outbound email. Uh, make sure you have end-to-end -end encryption for at least email containing confidential or personal information. Uh, this is typically used for public safety or HR uh, departments or transactions. Um, threat monitoring, very important. Sandboxing, uh, blacklisting. If you're if you if you don't uh, email. Uh, other countries, then blacklist those countries. That's that makes it very simple. Um, mobile device security. Uh, make sure that you have a policy in place. Among other things, our policy requires a software application on all devices called MOS 360. Um, any kind of device that's going to connect to our network must have that that security software installed. Uh, there are also rules that the user must follow. In our case, in the event that they lose or their device or their device is stolen. Um, and we also make the user, even whether it's the city manager, even if it's a council member, sign a mobile device policy. So they read that policy, they sign it, and we keep that a copy, they keep a copy. And it's just a reminder to them that this is very serious. Uh, physical security, it's not always top of mind, but uh, very important that your hardware systems are behind locked doors and they're always in a dry and cool place with a UPS backup and also fire protection if you can afford it. Uh, website security, uh, once one basic step you can take is to uh, move your site to a secure HTTPS and .gov domain. A recent study from uh, McAfee found that County websites in particular uh, lack basic security, but it's definitely more pervasive than just counties. So very important that you remember your website when you're thinking about network security. Uh, Offsite disaster recovery and um, business continuity planning, very important. Features of a proactive protections uh, process. You always want to back up your data so that you have a way to restore it, uh, whether it's damaged or ransomed. And also a business continuity plan is essentially having a restoration plan in place that at the very least, it will rank your applications in order of necessity. So for instance, you may want to restore um, your, your primary ERP system. Uh, we use BSNA, for example. You may use BSNA or HTE or Noveline. Um, you would want to include email, probably your phone system. Uh, at least those three things so that you can continue to com your communications, you can continue to handle permitting or accounts payable, et cetera. Uh, network assessments, very important. Um, another great first step that you, can, that you can take just to get a handle on the state of your current network security posture and then make a plan moving forward and how you can strengthen that posture. Uh, relationships and partnerships. Mike talked about um, the FBI, the CIA. These are all, these are all opportunities for you to, to uh, find out who those folks are that, that are in your area, make the connection. They can be of great use to your organization to in the, in the process phase. And even if you are hit with a ransomware attack, um, they are very valuable in your restoration plans. 
Uh, data breach response plan, also important. This is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, once you have your business continuity plan in place and you have your uh, disaster recovery and backup set up, um, maybe you partner uh, with an IT company that offers as part of their DR service uh, computers and office space as a backup. This is something we've done. Um, run tabletop drills on a regular basis to assess and, and then assess the outcomes, um, make changes as needed. And this may seem like overkill, but if your organization is hit with a ransomware, you will quickly learn that having a data breach response plan in place was, will be very helpful for mitigation purposes. And then if you can afford it, if this is something that's in your budget, I highly recommend having an internal local agency officer on staff as well. Um, this is fairly specialized. You might not require it, um, but if you can, I suggest that you do so. Uh, moving to the next slide here. So in the event, um, I understand the audience here, we're talking to townships, you, you don't have unlimited dollars, none of us do, but uh, in the event that you're, you're using or thinking about using a, a managed service provider for your IT, I just threw this slide together to give you a few helpful um, tips, things to look out for when determining that managed service provider. So you wanna make sure uh, that they have expertise in cybersecurity, disaster recovery, business continuity planning, all those things we talked about on the previous slide. Um, ensure that your IT environment will be highly secure. I would look for uh, staff that are highly certified. They have at least the types of certifications that I've listed here, certified ethical hacker, certified information security manager, CompTIA security plus, and so on. You wanna make sure that they can provide a guaranteed service level agreement. They have a very proactive support, uh, but they can assist with budgeting and planning upgrades. And finally, that you wanna make sure that you have a sense that that company uh, makes your success a priority. Uh, finally, with the next slide here, in summary, again, staff awareness and training program, very important, the most important step you can take implement proactive measures as previously discussed, business continuity plan in place and maintained regularly, a network security incident response plan, uh, partner with law enforcement, third-party cybersecurity experts, remain current with best practices and software patches, patches, another very important aspect and something that's easily done. Annual audits and assessments of your network security posture, make changes as needed, also good for planning your budgets. Um, making sure you have secure backups, ensure that they are not connected permanently to computers and networks that are being backed up, and then centralize your technology processes and your procurements with the IT department. Um, get rid of those silos, make sure you have one uh, department or one person kind of overseeing the entire uh, net, uh, city departments. And that's all I have. Thanks, Devin. Uh, John DiMaggio, let's, uh, let's go to you. You have to say about oh, all this. Excellent. Thanks, Mike. And um, and uh, thanks, Devin. So uh, I'm going to focus uh, great information uh, Mike and Devin shared uh, is coming with a little bit different um, different uh, spin on, on similar information. So first of all, uh, from a COVID standpoint, um, well, I'm, I'm John DiMaggio, CEO of Blue Orange Compliance. So we help uh, organizations uh, protect their information, assess, uh, assess where they are, and help them uh, guide them through uh, remediating and making their making their uh, organizations more se more secure and uh, able to protect their information. So, continuing, uh, COVID, I'll talk about COVID first. So, COVID uh, has really taken uh, the entire uh, business world into a breakneck pivot into uh, remote technology. So, we do a lot of work in healthcare. Uh, and in healthcare, you can imagine telehealth is something that was, you know, kind of a pilot uh, project for a lot of healthcare organizations. Now it's it's almost a way of life because um, um, you know providers and and and, and patients can't really uh, tough to get them to get them together. So that's one. And the other, as as we talked about, is um, is telework. Right, uh, people are working from home. 
which as we as we just discussed um, creates a lot of um, uh, of weaknesses um, uh, folks that are usually behind uh, firewalls and organizations are out at home so uh, there's a lot to consider there uh, and again this could be an entire topic so uh, so the good news is uh, we have uh, um, tele -well, tele work uh, work from home policy and procedure and some alerts that we'll share, uh, share for the um, participants at the end of this thing. We're talking about you know, expectation, who's allowed to work from home, and a lot of the security requirements that you can use in your own organizations to make sure that your, uh, that your workforce is working um, um, securely, uh, securely at home. So um, from a, uh, uh, about us, so uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we help organizations uh, assess, or assess where they are, uh, do th a lot of things that Dev was talking about: policies and procedures, testing to see if there's um, if there's uh, there's weaknesses, uh, ethical hacking, trying to break in as if we're bad guys. So so we help organizations depending on where they are uh, with a lot of this information. We are a national provider. Um, so to put a little, uh, different uh, spin on this, uh, I'm going to talk about a strategy uh, and a science around uh, cybersecurity. So something called uh, Devin talked about NIST, uh, NIST cybersecurity framework. So this is a uh, it's a framework around um, around cybersecurity and it breaks into um, some logical functions here. So um, one is to identify. So uh, Dev will talk about assessments. So are you doing assessments? Do you know what people use technologies? Do you know what technologies that you have and processes? So you're you're getting the lay of the land and finding out who uses technology and and how you're protecting it. Um, the next is, uh, is protect. So now that you know what you have uh, and all the resources, et cetera, then you can protect it. So you're implementing safeguards, you put in technology, some of the things that Devin was talking about, uh, uh, firewalls, um, uh, you, you train your staff, right? Um, which is, a, which is a, a thing as well. You wanna protect your environment. And then if you don't have policies and procedures, um, really there's no way to enforce it. So that's a protection stage. Um, then you've identified you're protecting now you want to detect so in a in a uh, i guess a house analogy identifying is taking an inventory of doors and windows protecting would be locking them detecting would be burglar alarm in, right so is somebody trying to break in have they just opened the door etc so you're talking about um processes uh, to detect are you looking at your your security logs uh are people uh, logging uh, logging in at, at, at strange times etc um uh, technology is monitoring technology out there. They can tell you that there, that uh, someone is actually attempting in or has has just broken in. Allow you to uh, to detect that when it happened. Uh, then you know you tried all these different uh, different uh, uh, solutions. Uh, then respond. So if something um, has happened. How are you going to respond? How are you going to uh, communicate? Is it a cyber attack? Is it ransomware? Who are you going to communicate with? Um, are you contacting the right the right people um are you trying to mitigate uh the, the issue that happened to make sure it's not uh, currently happening and then recover so once everything is settled down had to recover restore things back to back to normal and lessons learned and uh, some important factors here are is it's not just uh your it folks your network security folks right these are all stakeholders so executives need to be on board uh, they need to understand the processes um, the risks involved if there's risk that uh, IT is, uh, knows exist and executives don't know about it, or even your board knows about it, that's an issue. So they need to be on, be on board. And your business processes, which business processes or functions are, are totally dependent on technology. If, if technology wasn't around, how would it be effective? You know, one thing is, is obviously ransomware, not considering ransomware. And then your folks on the, on the operation side, your IT folks and, and the implementation folks. So it is, uh, it's not just the IT and security folks. Um, there should be governance, so your entire organization understands um, where you are in all this, and they're all players in that. So, um, taking this example into ransomware, okay? Ransomware uh, is a big topic right now, and all of these all of these um, threats are uh, magnified right now uh, as folks are working from home and in different environments, and maybe different technologies, maybe they're using home technologies versus um, company issued, et cetera. So here in a ransomware environment, some of the ways in are, uh, are through email or remote access. So identify all those ways into your environment if you have remote access for users to come in that way, et cetera. 
awareness level? Are people aware of these things? Um, would, if you had a ransomware attack, uh, would your billing be down? Would your uh, customer service be down? What, what, um, what uh, functions would, would that, uh, that um, uh, uh, apply to? Um, where's your data? Um, Devin said backups. Do you, uh, do you backup information regularly? Does, uh, can you recover? Can you recover? Have you, has it been tested? Uh, do you do, uh, do you have any vulnerabilities out there? Have you had someone try to uh, pay somebody to try to attack your network and see or someone that really wanted to do this could get? So that's, that'd be identified. Protecting security awareness and training. Can't say enough about that. Uh, your biggest threat is the employee you hired yesterday, right? So security awareness and training. Uh, lock down those open doors that you found. Um, give people the minimum amount of information they need to do their jobs, right? So if, if, if someone in billing has access to, uh, to all the rest of the financial data, there's no reason to do that. That again, uh, increases your profile. Um, technical things like antivirus and firewalls and things like that. Um, your, your backups, uh, Devin said we have those be uh, remote. So uh, one of the good techniques in ransomware is to have that ransomware leak into your backups uh, for a long period of time and then uh, they, they, uh, they're useless as well. Now, uh, detecting, um, you know, one of the things on here is awareness. So see something, say something. If someone clicked on a, on a link or something's, um, you know, strange, don't be embarrassed about it, have them raise their hands. The sooner you get that, the better. Monitor your network. Um, now, respond, respond and recover. Those are um, uh, things that you really don't know that are important until it happens to you, right? So, uh, coordinations. Do you have the FBI's, uh, how do you get hold of your FBI? Do you have your cyber insurance? Uh, do you understand your cyber insurance policy? Who to call and when? What are deductibles? Um, these tabletop exercises are uh, drills where you get some business people around the, around the, um, uh, around the table and talk about these things have happened. What do we do? And it kind of takes you through a mock exercise. You really learn a lot. So you can develop a playbook. So ransomware happens, you go to your playbook and then obviously test it. Uh, recover is going back to normal. Lessons learned. And this whole process is a, uh, it's a journey, not a destination. Things will change. Your technology will change. Your threats change. So it's a constant evolving process. So that kind of takes all the things that we've been talking about uh, up to now, puts it into a, into a science. And this is a, a good way to think about it. Um, we have additional information up on our website. I'll make these uh, these uh, um, these resources available as far as telework policy uh, and some of our uh, alerts that we send to our clients too, and they'd be useful to share to share with your workforce. And uh, this is how you uh, can get a hold of me. If you have any questions? Uh, feel free to uh, to let me know. I'm always uh, open to answering questions. Um, back to you, Mike. Thank you, John. I appreciate all of your time uh, away from your other duties, but uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, and now Bill uh, is going to talk with you, us about privacy, I believe. Uh, I thought I was going to talk about zebras. Oh, no, privacy. Right. Privacy. Well, zebras are fine. But, you know. <laughs> okay. So thank you, John and uh, Devin. You guys really set the stage uh, around information security. Um, people may be confused a bit about what is privacy. Privacy is a little different. Uh, a lot of times privacy at the big four firms is a subset of information security, uh, and it's part of that, but it's a little bit different. Uh, anytime that there's personal information involved, then you're talking about privacy. So uh, if it is a uh, identifier, like a social security number or a driver's license, and then what is that being linked to? That is privacy. Um, it talks about the rights of the individual, and a lot of the privacy that we see today has come to us from Europe where privacy is a right to, of the individual. Um, United States is a little bit more focused on the business, uh, but in Europe, uh, where the, the major regulations came from, uh, it's about the individual and the rights of the individual. Um, when we talk about security and all the great things that Devin and, and John just talked about, um, what's the difference between security and privacy? Security is about locking up the data, about protecting the data uh, from inappropriate access. Privacy is about using the data correctly. So you receive this data from your township citizens or your employees, and you gave, they gave it to you for a particular reason. And we wanna make sure that we're using it for the appropriate reasons. So security is about protecting it, and privacy is about using it. Um, there's an old adage, there's an interplay between them. You can have uh, security without privacy, but you can't have privacy without security. 
because security is part of privacy, making sure that uh, it's not accessed by inappropriate people. Um, and, and what does that mean for COVID? Uh, what we want to look at, I think, is, and we'll, we'll kind of come back, back to this at a, a later slide, is what has changed in your organization? You, before COVID, you had processes set up. You had interplay with a lot of the security controls that John and, and Devin talked about, access controls and identification of sensitive information. But now you have a workforce that has been disrupted, and those processes are different. So what is different? What has changed and exposed new risk that we didn't have before? So on my slides, we can go to the first slide, which is about the U.S. states. Um, and as I said, privacy came to us from Europe. Um, that was really the heart of it after the war, and it grew uh, significantly since then. Uh, United States does not have a federal privacy regulation uh, as of yet. Uh, there's a couple that are on the table that are in the works, but we really don't have anything. Um, I think the strength of our legislative system is our state legislation. Because we have so many different states with different rules, um, we've had, you know, this is in the play in security for years uh, with what, states like Massachusetts and Nevada coming out first with encryption regulations. But the United States doesn't really traditionally have a federal privacy regulation. California is the first state to pass a significant regulation. It's called the CCPA. It went into effect on January 1st. Uh, Washington State is, uh, has bellied up to the table. Their regulation is, is coming very quickly, um, uh, followed by like Virginia and, and some of the other ones on the map that you can see that are in play right now. Um, most of these regulations are either a, a subset of the European regulation, which is called the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, one of the main components about these regulations is that they give significant rights back to the individuals or the data subjects to see what data you have of theirs. So uh, in California, as of January 1st, if you're a citizen of California, you can go to any business and say, I wanna see what data you have of mine and what are you doing with it and how are you protecting it? So states are, 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 are starting to wake up to this. There's, there's uh, across our country, there's more and more regulations in play. Um, and I think it's just a matter of time before either every state has, has something more modern than, than what is in place today. For instance, you know, the Michigan laws have been around for quite some time. I think 2004 was, uh, was the original identity theft. And they're more tactically focused on specific things like identity theft and breach. So um, the, the more modern privacy regulations are looking at it more from a programmatic standpoint. They want you to have uh, frameworks, just like John and Devin showed you with their frameworks. You know, there's privacy frameworks that start to look at the entire picture. So the governance and the training and the policies and, and all those pieces around it, plus the individual rights piece. And the individual rights piece is enormous. Um, and I'll get to that in a minute. So as we move on to uh, the next slide, uh, I have a slide on operationalizing privacy. And what does a privacy program look like? Um, it, it really install, uh, involves overall, these, all these different areas on here are specific to the same thing, which is understanding the data that you have of your uh, township residents or your employees. So what data do you have it? Why do you have it? Why, why did we collect this data? Why are you using it? How are you using it? Who are you sharing it with? What are those uh, you know, partners that, that have to use it because they're conducting certain processes? Um, and as we start to go around the ring, everything kind of falls into a play around those key themes. So uh, privacy training, obviously we heard you know, from both speakers today that training is in extremely important and it's no different with personal information. Uh, even you know, the HIPAA regulation that was written in 1996 specifically says if you're handling uh, protected health information, you have to be trained. Uh, so, that, so don't uh, underestimate the importance of this. Um, these are the folks that want to come to work every day and do a good job, uh, but they, you got to give them the tools and they have to be um, appropriately trained. Privacy impact assessments. I, I believe, uh, Devin, you spoke about a security assessment of your network. It's very important to look from a privacy perspective at the processes that we have. So why are we doing this data? Is, it, is the process still valid? Has it changed? Oh, we changed vendors. Um, maybe we have the new vendors doing things a different way than the old vendor and has that process changed? And what's the impact to the personal information that's involved in that? Um, we want to make sure that 
you know, the, 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 the questions come down to, is it a, a place where we may be causing harm? Uh, privacy is really kind of about causing harm to the individual through the use of this data. Um, managing third party risk, more and more with cloud-based suppliers and uh, providers, more and more companies and, and organizations are, are using third parties to manage parts of their IT environment. And third party risk assessments, third party managements are key for this because they are also uh, processing personal information on, on your behalf. And if they have a breach, it's not their problem, it's your problem because they breached your data. So you have to make sure that the things are in place to make sure that you know your vendors and third parties are taking control and protecting the data the way you expect them to. Privacy notices are a very key piece in privacy. And that basically comes down to the old adage of say what you're gonna do and do what you're gonna say. So with your privacy notice, you tell the, your, your, uh, your citizens and your data subjects what you're doing with the data, why you're collecting it, how you're processing it, who you're sharing it with. Privacy notices uh, under California regulation have to have certain um, pieces involved telling you about the, the type of data that's being processed. California also brought us a new piece that we didn't really track before in use, and that is uh, data as a commodity. Um, data is worth information, I mean, data is worth money, and uh, Companies are now buying and selling data. Um, and, and so the individual has a right and even has a, a right in certain cases to opt out of the sale of their data. So what, what this means is you need better granular control of the data that you're using and understanding how you're using it. Um, due diligence and monitoring. These are other key themes that we've heard in the other two presentations of watching what's going on. So uh, constant assessments, reevaluation, just because you did it once doesn't mean it's always uh, being followed and making sure that your organization uh, understands the rules and is going by them. So those are just a few key areas for operationalizing a privacy uh, environment. What brings all those together is on the next slide, privacy inventory and controls. When a lot of people talk about a data inventory, um, they instantly think to the most basic level. I have five levels on this slide. Um, and to me, the most basic level is what's the system? All right, what system do we have that in? Um, and a, we can even expand that concept to say, what's the repository? It might be a share drive, it might be an Excel sheet in, in a share drive or email, uh, or even a third party. So what systems and repositories? The next level up is, uh, is uh, the sensitivity. What type of data is it? Is it data that we care about? Is it tied to a person? Is it a social security number and a behavioral type information like you know, a tax payment or something like that? Um, or is it uh, just a, a property information with no, with no risk because there's no individual tied to it? The linkability there is uh, what gets us in privacy. Um, as we move up the chain, the sensitivity of that data. So you know, now that we know what the data elements are, what's the sensitivity level of it? Is it PII? Is it PI? Is it uh, protected health information? Is it financial information? Is it tax information? So because your controls that you apply are going to uh, elevate as your sensitivity level goes. The, th the fourth level in my inventory is purpose. And this was brought to us by GDPR. And GDPR in Europe was actually, their main point was, map out your organization by your processes. So tell me what business process you have, what data you're using for it, and um, why you have it. And uh, this has to go back to your notice statement that, that ties that you've got it appropriately. And the highest level is uh, the identity. So can you specifically pull out all the information for a John Smith or whoever it might be? Um, as we look at these different layers, there's controls that you will apply across the board uh, strategically to these different sets of information. And they are the types of uh, controls that John and, and uh, Devin spoke about. Um, I break them down into controls for data at rest, which might be you know, data on your network, and that's encryption, that's uh, you know, uh, pseudonymization, anonymization, those types of things to secure and minimize the amount of data that people can get. There's also controls for data in motion. So that's where we talk about TLS and security and, and data flying out of the, out the door and who's it going to, is it going to the other vendors? Um, so we also have controls around access and who has access, legitimate access for this. 
Um, I think, uh, John, you had mentioned about minimization, which is a very strong privacy control. Only take the data that you need to do the job and uh, don't expand upon that. So the less data that you have in your environment, the better, um, which really goes against uh, what we used to think in, in IT, um, where it was like, hey, well, what do you need for that project? Well, I'm not sure it's in that database. Just send me everything and I'll figure it out later. I mean, I mean that, is, that is exactly how things were done. And now you have to justify every piece. And the way you justify every piece is through privacy impact assessments. And privacy impact assessments look at their use of your uh, processes and systems and make judgments of, against harm around those types of things. Are you using the data appropriately? So what we have now is these processes that you've mapped out in your organization. We have the appropriate controls that are applied across those processes. And we've done some assessments to make sure that we're good. We're feeling pretty good about it. And then what happens? So uh, COVID happens and all of a sudden we change everything. And those um, processes and controls that we used to have that we were comfortable with all of a sudden are disrupted. We're now using um, a Zoom platform, which is a vendor that nobody qualified, that nobody did an assessment on, nobody has a contract with, and nobody knows the weaknesses of it until they start to appear in the newspaper. We may have processes where people were working at home, were at, in the office on a desktop machine, but now that we're asking them to work at home on a personal machine. Um, and again, as, as, as Devin mentioned, no security controls that would be expected there. So, you know, there's lots of different scenarios that this might show, but what it does show is that there's a disruption in what your plan processes were. And COVID, I think, is, is, is uh, it, it, I, I've seen that through friends of things that they're doing um, because they're working from home and it's different. So um, it's, it's, it's a disruption. And I think, you know, that's where maybe security assessments and, um, uh, privacy impact assessments for some of those processes that are now being conducted differently than that were done before will at least uh, give you some uh, confidence in your due diligence that you've taken some of the steps to make sure that you're uh, not disrupting as much as you could be. Um, one of the other pieces that COVID has brought us is this concept around um, uh, consent uh, contact tracing. Um, and, you know, the idea was done in in China, it was done in uh, South Korea very effectively where if somebody had it, we traced everybody else who had it. And, um, uh, you know, we, we found out where the virus went through this tracing. Right now, contact tracing in the United States, there's no laws that cover it directly. It has to be consent based. You have to have con direct consent from the individual to be able to track that. Um, the whole world of Internet of Things has changed uh, the IT space from what I call transaction based uh, work to behavioral based work. And who somebody spoke with at a certain time is very private and personal information. And you can't just assume that you're going to be able to get that information. Um, I believe that one of the reasons that the Far East was more successful in that is that their governments are more dogmatic in their rule. And when they say jump, the citizens say how high. And the United States is a little bit different, actually vastly different. And to get consent to do co uh, uh, contact tracing, I think is gonna be extremely difficult. Plus it's extremely time consuming um, and quickly will get out of control from the manual processes that it's gonna take to get that done. Uh, there are some technology companies, there's a great company, I think it's called Blue Sky out of uh, Toronto that's doing a, um, um, a web-based uh, or a, a mobile device-based contact management thing to see but to that linkability back to the personal information is, is tough. So, um, I, and I don't know how effective this is gonna be long-term. I, I would, my advice would be somebody looks very long and hard before trying to roll out any kind of contact tracing work right now. Um, I, I, I don't know how realistic that's gonna be. And, and like I say, you have to have consent. You have to have opt-in consent. Um, so that's, uh, that's hopefully I stuck to my six minutes. Uh, Michael, um, I am a Bill Shaman. I'm a privacy professional. Worked uh, 20 years doing this for Big Four, Big Four Consulting, um, and uh, started with uh, in the IT space. And uh, you know, happy to talk to anybody about any of these concepts anytime. So back to you, Mike. Oh, 
Bill, thank you. Uh, you know, I was just sitting here thinking, uh, one of my neighbors who works for one of the large, I'm not even going to get into the industry, but uh, is now working at home. And, and, and like me, although I'm usually direct wire on my uh, modem, uh, I do work with the Wi-Fi because I've been kicked out of my office here at the house by my wife who's working at home too now. But anyway, so I'm on Wi-Fi. Well, we have all our stuff encrypted. I just thank God, right? Um, but anyway, this very nice f friend and neighbor uh, said, you know, I'm working at home now, and I I'm thinking I probably ought to do that encryption thing on that Wi-Fi that I'm using, you know, dealing with all my company secrets and so on and so forth. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, but practically speaking, that's what we're talking about. You've you've sent people home; they're working from home, and uh, just basic things like encryption that you know to everybody on this this uh, this presentation get gets it, but not everybody does uh, who doesn't look at these issues. Well, and those are the obvious ones. I I was talking to a woman who was an administrator at a school system, and she said, um, you know, part of her job involved a mainframe report. And so she had to go drive to the school, pick up the report, and then drive home. So now the report's, you know, outside the building, outside the doors. So it's loose, right? So that's one that nobody, you know, would have predicted, you know, that, hey, when we now have, you know, loose data kind of multiplying across the environment. And so what happens with that, you know? So that's, yeah. the, car that, that, that's the car that gets stolen, and now you've got a problem. Exactly. Anyway, anyway on, to, on to Karina. Who's going to? I hope, Karina. I'm sorry, but since we're partners, I can I can uh, be direct with you, and we're going to have to keep our part here, your part, very short because we are way over. But Karina is going to present us with some of the law, and uh, you know that's what lawyers talk about. But uh, yeah, on that point, I, I I do have a slide. I didn't talk about it, but obviously you need all these uh, systems and protocols in place in advance, and then you know a, a quick contact list for you know, okay, I've been hacked, now what do I do? Hopefully you are well aware of it. But um, I listed on there, of course, you might expect that some of the people you might want to call are the attorneys and the PR types. And not so much because of anything going on internally, but it's, and we've touched on this, we haven't talked much about it, this is just only so much time, but the impact of, of the things that you have in your systems that will impact those third parties who did not expect a breach of your data to impact them at home or in their business. That, that's a big deal and, and that's some of. Well, and, that's, and that should be part of your breach response, your tabletop exercises to have those uh, third parties teed up. And so, I mean, cause I, I was doing one for a national retailer and you know, we threw that out, said, hey, you, know, you gotta call this vendor. And then everybody looked at each other. It's like, well, who's the contact over there? Nobody knew. So all those people have to be lined up. They should really almost be part of the, the tabletop. You know, to, you could do one focused just on your vendors, you know. Yep. Okay, Karina, take it away. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, thank you very much for everyone for having me here. Um, really quickly, I want to go through a, a rundown of what some of the federal and state laws are that protect your privacy and provide certain remedies and controls in case of a breach. Um, the first one, which uh, has been touched upon by Bill, is HIPAA. Um, I believe everyone should be very familiar with HIPAA. Um, the whole purpose is to protect your sensitive patient health information. Um, and even in the time of COVID, while some of the portions of HIPAA are being relaxed by the government, for example, they widen the ability of doctors to uh, do appointments via video, so telemedicine. Um, even though there is a little bit of a relaxation, you still have to comply with the privacy rule. You still have to comply with the security rule. And after the pandemic, you still have to comply with all the portions of HIPAA. None of those have actually been repealed by the government. Uh, Federally, uh, also referring to the Graham Leach uh, laws, which have been enacted, and I believe uh, John might have referred to them, it requires financial institutions to explain what sort of information sharing practices that they have for their customers and also what kind of safeguards that they have, just in case 
they're, they have sensitive private information from all of their customers, which they will. They will have personally identifiable information such as social security number, name, date of birth, address. I want to mention the Homeland Security Act because both Devin and Bill talked about NIST. While the primary purpose of the Homeland Security Act is to pre prevent terrorism, it's also responsible for the creation of NIST, which uh, develops standards and guidelines for cybersecurity protections. Moving on to a state level, Michigan has its Identity Theft Protection Act, which I believe Bill also mentioned, which actually increased the types of protections that are available, increased the amount of personally identifiable information, which is protected. So name, address, driver's license number, social security number is an obvious one, but also interestingly added biometric identifiers. So fingerprints, uh, Detroit Metro Airport started to enact, and the Atlanta Airport started to enact facial recognition. That would be a biometric that is a, something that is able to identify an individual and therefore protect them under this act. Um, it also requires breach notification uh, outlines, or has breach notification outlines in case of a database breach. Michigan's Social Security Number Privacy Act requires that only the four numbers of someone's social security number can be used. Can't use the entire social security number when you are referencing somebody. It also cannot be the account number. You can't put it on the outside of an envelope. Granted, some of this seems very obvious, but they were at your, someone's social security number for a while was being used as an account number for um, different types of like credit institutions or whatnot. And so now this stops it to just four sequential digits. And I've seen the first, I've seen the last. Unfortunately, if you can sleuth it and try to put it together at times, but um, still missing one or two digits. Michigan's Medical Records Access Act um, is meant to regulate the access to and disclosure of medical records. So it outlines who can obtain the medical records and also the process to do so. As um, briefly discussed, um, students in the state of Michigan also have privacy protections. So there are certain student records that would be protected under the Michigan Revised School Code, or school code of 2016. Michigan's Broad Insurance Code also provides certain uh, data and security measures. So I want to in depth more to, or more in depth to talk about the Michigan Data Security Act, also known as the Michigan Cybersecurity Act. Um, what's important for that is that it imposes cybersecurity requirements on individuals and businesses that are licensed by the Michigan Department of Insurance and Financial Services. And because this was relatively recently enacted in 2018, there are still parts of it that are rolling out. So there are requirements that are coming up in 2021, 2022, and 2023. So we will see within the insurance industry itself heightened privacy requirements uh, that those licensed have to abide by. And like we've talked about previously with breaches, there are breach reporting requirements in the Data Security Act as well. Now, I know we've talked about a lot of best practices and how to maintain security in this new world that we're living in. But one of the things I want to talk about is even if you go through staff awareness training, as Devin has mentioned, but you still have a breach. Um, in the state of Michigan, we have a, an invasion of privacy claim. So if somebody invades your privacy, you can bring them to court and potentially obtain a, a judgment against them. One of the most important cases on that subject is actually Doe versus the Henry Ford Health System, which the Kitsch firm actually happened to litigate and won, which interestingly, an invasion of privacy in Michigan is an intentional tort. So it requires a, an intentional action. So if you go through, if you have a, an employee who goes through 
the staff awareness training that Devin was talking about, or they do the um, the roundtables where they're talking about what happens if we do have a data security breach, but they're still unintentionally, they're just negligent in allowing a, a privacy breach, then that is arguably not something that your institution would be liable for under this case in the state of Michigan. I know I kept it very brief, uh, but I also know I'm at the end of the webinar. <laughs> so um, it's a really quick lowdown. My contact information, uh, as, along with Mike Watts' contact information, is included on the slide. More than happy to go through any of these laws or any other cases or any instances uh, more in depth. Thank you, Karina. Uh, yeah, I, you know, in the healthcare field, there's a there's a story that is out there about the uh, the doctor who calls into the hospital uh, floor and says, "Okay, I need to update on the patient X, and uh, I can't access the hospital system through my office system. The two don't talk to each other that well, and so can you just take a screenshot of the screen on the hospital computer system and send it to me via your unprotected text system on your phone?" You know, hey, we got to take care of the patient, but yeah, so all kinds of things. I, I really very much appreciative of everybody being here. Uh, everyone's very busy. Obviously, you you folks are all right in the the center of all this COVID cybersecurity issues, and really appreciate you taking the afternoon to work with us. This will be available, and I'm sure Shelley will tell you this, but it'll be available on the M Michigan Township Association uh, website. And uh, I referenced the ProTec uh, uh, group that I'm part of that has cities and townships and counties and so on. And we'll have, we, we review these issues on a monthly basis uh, through, through that entity as well. But thank you. And thank you, MTA, for allowing us to present this material. I, I hope it's helpful. Thank you.